This is the Life and Mission Podcast. I'm Kay Helm, and today my guest is Kent Sanders. Kent is, he's a ghostwriter, he's a storyteller, he is a writer who helps other writers, and that's how we connected through the Daily Writer Club that Kent runs. Hi, Kent. Welcome to the Life and Mission Podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate you taking the time to chat and uh, let me come on your show and hopefully I can add some value. Oh, I know you will. I mean, I'm, I learn from you every week in the daily writer and on your podcast. Oh, so. well, thank you. Thank you. Somebody's listening to my show. There's one person out there. Yes. That's listening. No, <laughs> the more listener. than one, more than one people listen. One people. <laughs> yes. I'm a professional writer. I don't even have correct grammar. That's how that so, works. Oh. Yes. <laughs> yes. People, please take me seriously. I know. I always cringe when I send a text to a client and I have a autocorrect gets a hold of it. <laughs> yeah. Then it has some, some other kind of wild, crazy meaning. Yes. Always. That's how that works. But uh, I don't think uh, the good thing is that's kind of a universal experience now. So it is not it a is. bad thing. Yeah. Well, Kent, you, you've got a lot going on now. When I say ghostwriter, we probably need to explain that because not everybody knows what that is, or we have different mm-hmm. ideas about what that means. So sure. let's start there and then we'll work our way through some of the different things that you do. You're a ghostwriter. Tell us what it is to be a ghostwriter, and then we'll talk about uh, some of your recent releases. Well, let me answer the the question directly, then I want to expand on it. Okay. So ghostwriting basically is when you're writing on somebody else's behalf and they're getting credit for it. That's kind of the straight up definition of ghostwriting. It's a super, super common practice in the book world with self-published books, with hybrid published books, traditional publishing. Nobody really knows for sure because the nature of ghostwriting and what it is, it means it's kind of a hidden practice to some degree. Mm -hmm. So therefore it's really hard to get accurate stats on things like this because of what it is. But I've heard people in the know about these things say up to 40% of books are ghostwritten, particularly nonfiction books. And particularly those who are, are written by celebrities, politicians, well-known figures, those kinds of people. So on the surface, ghostwriting basically is writing a book for somebody who doesn't have the time or the talent to write the book themselves. You're using their stories, their ideas, their, maybe they have a framework for some kind of business concept or political thing or whatever the case might be. So you're taking that and you're writing really in their voice and on their behalf. Sometimes as a ghostwriter, you get credit. Sometimes you don't. It all is kind of in the details and how you negotiate contracts. And there's all kinds of things that go into that. What I prefer though, is really the idea of collaboration. For example, just so we're recording this in November of 2022, just last month, a book came out called The Faith of Elvis, which, Kay, you were talking about some copies you got for your family yeah. for Christmas. So thanks for supporting the book. Absolutely. This was a book that I wrote with Elvis Presley's stepbrother, whose name is Billy Stanley. We were telling the story of Elvis's faith and spiritual journey. And my name is actually on the book cover. Now it's it's smaller because it says Billy Stanley with Kent Sanders, which is a, a super common way to do that. So they're kind of acknowledging the writer, but the 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 main author's name is in a much larger font size. Mm-hmm. That is really a good example of a book that was really a collaboration. It wasn't a ghostwriting thing in the sense of it the, the stuff didn't just come from me. It was really truly a collaborative writing experience because it was Billy's stories. I added some things here and there, particularly when it comes to the scripture portions of of a bunch of the chapters. Mm-hmm. Then I had to figure out how to organize it, how to make it all flow, do all the writerly things that we writers do. Right. But really the content was truly Billy. So that was truly a collaborative thing. So that's really what I prefer to think of ghostwriting as is it's not, I mean, now sometimes it can be, you come in and do everything and somebody else gets the credit. It can work like that. But my favorite projects are the ones where it really is a collaboration mm-hmm. between myself and, and the author. That's the way I prefer to look at it too. In the books that I've worked yeah. on, it's been like somebody has a course and they want to make it into a book. And totally. well, you know, as the professional writer, you come in and you say, okay, this is how we do that. And I'll just take care of the details of making that happen. And exactly. it's that person's ideas. It's their thoughts. It's their framework, blueprint process, right? All those things that, that we, we do. And, 
and you just put it together because you're the one who knows how, like you hire a mechanic exactly. to fix your car, you hire a writer exactly. to fix your book. <laughs> so. And it's funny with ghostwriting sometimes, and I'm sure you've had these conversations with people, Kay, where you talk about ghostwriting and people sort of step back and they're a little bit of gas, like, why would you ever want to write something and somebody else gets the credit for it? But really that's a, that kind of perspective is a misunderstanding of what really the process is for writing any book. Mm -hmm. And I always think those conversations are a great point of education for people because I love talking about it and talking about how books are made. Even if you don't use a ghostwriter and you write your own book, it's still a collaborative thing because an editor's involved, sometimes multiple editors. If you have a developmental editor, somebody doing line or copy editing, then if you have a proofreader, you have people who are working on the formatting and layout and the Amazon stuff, if it's on Amazon, which it should be, the cover design. So books are always, a, they they always will be, and they've always been a collaborative medium, just like filmmaking is or TV or anything else. Yes. So ghostwriting is really no different in that respect. It's just the, the writing element is more outsourced to somebody else, but it's all books are a collaborative thing. Mm -hmm. That's a great, great way to look at it. I, when when you write a book for somebody, when you're the ghostwriter, and I want to come back to the Elvis book because that's really cool, but maybe you can use that for an example. You know, what's the process sure. when you write a book for somebody or with somebody? Well, it really depends on the particular project. And I'll give you two extremes. And the Elvis book kind of falls in the middle. So one extreme is where somebody brings me into a project and they basically say, can you do a book on X, Y, Z topic? And I'll basically do all the content. I'll come up with the frameworks. I'll go out and I may interview people, or I may look at some historical stories and include those, or listen to some podcasts or talks that the client has done or whatever it is. There's all kinds of ways to source material for a book, yeah. but the client may not actually be that involved in it. I did a book like that not too long ago where, where the, the client who hired me was, we did a few calls, maybe three or four brief calls in the process of doing the book, but like 99.99% of the book was stuff that I just created. And there were a few, maybe three or four stories in the book that came from the client, but otherwise it was all me. So that's kind of, and I, and that was totally a great way to work. I have no complaints about that. It actually was really time saving because I just kind of went off and did my thing. Yeah. We didn't have to do a lot of calls and all this stuff. At the other extreme is when a client is really, really involved, when we do a lot of calls, when when they want to be really involved in the book, when they want to get their hands in the Word document and they're making edits and corrections. So I just finished a book literally this week. I'm sending it off. Where that is that is the case, where they're, the client really becomes the the editor in many respects. The Elvis book, I would say, was kind of in the middle because once we had the outline for the book, then Billy, Elvis's stepbrother, mm -hmm. Billy and I did, we talked probably twice a week for about 10 weeks. Those calls range from an hour to two hours. And I would just ask him questions about, we would typically cover two to three chapters in a single phone call. Mm -hmm. So I would come to the call and I, I would say, hey, today we're going to work on chapters 13, 14, and 15. I know they're going to be on this topic and I would prepare seven to 10 questions typically about that topic. Let's say we were doing a chapter on, so that there's a, there's a chapter in the book on Elvis and Billy and how their relationship was centered around cars. Elvis mm -hmm. was a big car guy. Mm -hmm. He loved cars and Billy's a big car guy. So that we did a chapter on their love for cars and hot rods in the book. So I would just have seven seven or eight questions that I would ask him about. Tell me a story about this or why did Elvis love this particular car or tell me about Elvis's cars. And the cool thing about that project is that Billy is a phenomenal gifted storyteller. He is a really, really good storyteller. So he would tell me these stories and he's been telling Elvis stories for decades. Yeah. So this was not like a new thing for him. And of course we record the calls. And once I have all those stories for those chapters, then I've got to figure out how to weave them together into a coherent narrative Right. So the chapter has a flow to it. So it's it's not just like a collection of random stories there. And there's really an art to doing that. And it's just mm -hmm. kind of a writerly thing. And then once you have a draft of the book done, then the editor gets involved and 
you kind of go from there, really. So it's very much an People think of writing books as kind of this mysterious thing where you go into this dark cavern for a few months and, you know, you go to your apothecary table with all your Harry Potter things and you mix these chemicals and poof, out comes this magical book. And it's not like that at all. It's very much like constructing a house. Mm -hmm. You put the foundation down, which is the book outline and who the audience is and all that stuff. Then you build the frame. Then you, you know, you're filling it in with later on with carpet and drywall and shingles and I'm getting out of my depth here because I know nothing about construction. So this metaphor is breaking down quickly, but you kind of get the point, right? Doing a book is just a very, it's a very step-by-step process and really it's not mysterious at all. And once you do it a couple of times, you really get the hang of it. And Mm -hmm. writing is mostly a matter of sitting your behind in the chair and doing the work. It's tedious. It can be boring. There's a lot of rewriting and editing. But that's that's kind of the gig. So that's basically how books are made, at least from my perspective. Yeah, it is. I I, I use the, the image of putting together a puzzle a lot of times. You know, oh, somebody that's hands good. me a box of pieces. That's really good. <laughs> you know, especially as a ghostwriter, I get the box of yeah. pieces and I have to figure out how do they go together. And I have the picture of what they want it to do, what they want to accomplish and who they want to reach and all that. That's the, the big picture that I'm looking at, right? Mm-hmm to figure out how the pieces go together and you you might try some things and turn them this way and that way. And for me, the hardest part is coming up with the outline, but then yeah. once I have the outline, now you have a structure and you can work in that structure. Exactly. The, that structure tells me what to do. And I sit down at the laptop every day. Yeah. It's sort of like with the puzzle, you, you get all the edge pieces first. Mm-hmm. So therefore you, you have the constraints of what the image is going to be. But if you don't have those constraints, you don't really know how things are going to go together. Right. You don't know where to stop and where to start. So getting that outline or getting the edges of that puzzle finished gives you the parameters and the framework. And it becomes way easier once you are kind of boxed into that book outline, I think. Yeah, it's great. It's it's interesting how much that constraints actually can spark creativity. Because totally. now I have to totally. now I have to fit it into this structure. I have to I have to Yeah do something to make it work in that structure. And and that actually makes you brings out the creativity. Totally. So like on my desk, you know, I've got an iPhone. It's really hot for some reason. Oh, it's been on the charger. I'm like, Oh, this is weirdly hot. I hope it's not going to explode. But this, this is an iPhone 13. And you know, whenever they just, whenever they have to figure out what they're going to do to upgrade this, they have to fit it in the parameters of, of the dimensions Mm -hmm. of this iPhone. But that constraint you know, when they, whenever they first came out with the, the first iPhone, the constraint of, okay, all of our components have to fit within these parameters. Yeah. That makes them invent new things and have to find new ways of doing things. And you bring about new technology. So yeah, I love the constraints. That's where I think all the innovation takes place. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really, really neat thing. I actually listened to a podcast recently about, uh, it was with the, uh, one of the guys on the team that came up with the Pixel camera on the Google phones. Oh, really? And talking about how you make the zoom work without pixelating the image in this camera. And and it got super, super geeky. And there was a point where I really didn't understand anything he was saying. And I went, Oh, my son would love this. And, but it, it it was just, to me, it was fascinating because it was the constraints that, that pushed the innovation. Exactly. Like you're saying. Yeah. I love that. I love that. So it's all around us, you know, but so let's let's go back to you just wrote a book with Elvis's stepbrother about mm-hmm. Elvis's faith and it's doing pretty well and I know in, in my household don't tell anybody but that's what Christmas gifts are this year so <laughs> it'll be our secret <laughs> right and so this is the the great thing about not having a lot of people listen to your podcast <laughs> so, <laughs> what so do you think all my family's getting all right. Yeah, exactly. So, but, you know, you, when did you start ghostwriting and then what, tell us about kind of your road to getting from, oh, I, I enjoy writing and maybe this is a thing to now you have a book that you produced with a, a publisher, a, a serious publisher with mm-hmm. Elvis's stepbrother. How, what, what happened between point A and point B? 
That's a really good question. And I would say the best way to kind of explain all that is that I decided to basically pursue two tracks in my side business. I'm not saying this is the way anybody else should do it. It's just just the way I did it because I didn't know any better. And I just have always kind of felt like any forward momentum is good, even if I don't always know where I'm going with it. I think it's good to kind of know a direction and you just do things sometimes and you kind of figure it out as you go along. Yeah. So long story short too. What's that? You learn on the way as well. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So I got into podcasting around 2013. So I've been podcasting almost 10 years, which sounds crazy to me. And now it hasn't been consistent all that time. There were, there were two or three years or parts of years that I've taken off in there. So I'm on currently my fourth version of my podcast. So started out with with two different podcasts on creativity. None of them did very well. I didn't really have a goal for them, mm-hmm. but I had a lot of fun doing them. And I really, really loved doing interviews. And I knew that by doing interviews, I was connecting with people. You know, I would go to conferences. I would connect with, with people in groups online. And so this whole time I was building relationships with people. And I've been doing this for a really long time. And I knew that there would come a point whenever I would want to build my own business and and I would really need those connections to help me. But also I wanted people who I could help. It wasn't just a one-way street. And I was doing all that because at that point I had been teaching at a Christian college for probably 12 or 13 years. I was getting really bored with my job. Our enrollment was going down. I wasn't really happy with what I was doing. So I knew that I needed to kind of come up with a plan B. So around 2015 in, at our college, we actually had a a huge blow up. We had a bunch of faculty and staff leave. It was the kind of situation. And before we hit recording this call, okay, we were talking about things that can go wrong with nonprofits and organizations. And it was that exact situation. Uh, We had three or four really unrelated things kind of come to a head at once. And the whole situation just blew up. It was very ugly. There was like a local church involved where there was a lot of conflict and drama. And we had a lot of people leave. And I saw a lot of people leave our school on bad terms. They left under duress or they had, they were let go or, or whatever the situation was. And I swore to myself whenever all that happened that I would not let that happen to me. And whenever I left the school, that I would do so on my own terms and in my own timing. So I swore to myself that I was going to build a side business and I was going to figure it out and somehow make it work. So I continued doing all the podcasting and creating my own books and sort of building up my own things while at the same time doing client work, because that was a much faster for me, a much faster way to make income. So I started doing podcast show notes, doing some freelance writing, other kinds of things. I did a lot of things that didn't work. Like one summer, I tried selling stuff on Amazon, doing the fulfillment by Amazon thing. That was a total disaster. I tried doing network marketing another summer. That was an even worse disaster. So (laughs) I I made a lot of mistakes trying to build a business of some kind. If I would have just listened to my wife the whole time who told me to focus on writing, it would have been way, way simpler and it would have happened faster. So she, she saw what you enjoyed and what you're good at, right? Yeah, but I just didn't. I don't know. I was afraid and I just, part of the the difficulty of, I think, online business stuff is that you see what's working for other people and you mm-hmm. assume, and you kind of think that's going to be a quick way to build a business. Like I saw people who were doing fulfillment by Amazon and I was like, oh, I could do that probably on the side. And you can, but you have to stick with it and really learn how to do it well to be successful at it. And I didn't mm-hmm. put the time in. So anyway, long story short, um, I was doing my own stuff with podcasts and books and, and content, but I wasn't really making any money at that, even though I really enjoyed it. That really helped to build up my network, which has really been critical. Yeah. But then at the same time, I was doing client work. And whenever it came time to make a decision about a business, I knew that the quickest way to make money was probably going to be doing client work. And I took a course by our mutual friend, Nick Pavlidis, mm-hmm. on ghostwriting. And I knew that was the direction I wanted to go because whatever business I was going to build had to focus on writing as the main thing, because that's my main marketable skill. I also wanted to have a business where I was, I could do from anywhere. I could set my own schedule, that type of thing. 
So that's why I really focused on ghostwriting because books are a fairly simple thing to explain to people. Mm-hmm. When people ask me what I do and I say I'm a ghostwriter, I can very easily explain. I write books for people who don't have the time or the desire to write their own book. We can do a book that builds your business or tells your story or builds your brand or whatever. Yeah, that's good. So that's really why I chose ghostwriting as my main client work type of business. At the same time, though, I want to do my own stuff. So that's why I've continued to write my own books, do the Daily Writer Club, of which you're part of. And I love having you part of that community. I do my own Daily Writer podcast. So I've kind of always maintained this thing of I, I'm doing client work, but I'm also doing my own stuff on the side. And that's that has meant that things have built more slowly than they probably could have. Mm-hmm. But I don't want to give either of those up because the things that I learned from client work that I applied to my own business or my to my own writing and content. But I think the fact that I've done podcasting a lot of, uh, for a long time, I write my own books. I think that helps me when I come to client work because it means I'm not just a writer. I also uh, run a podcast. I run a membership community. I write my own books. So that helps make my client's experience richer, I think, because of that. That's a really long answer to your question. But that's essentially the the road I took to get there. That's cool. I, I just want to comment on that structure, like you said, of building your own your own content, your books, your podcast, right. and the, the Daily Writer Club. Those are all things that you create content for. Yes. And by doing that, I th- this is this is what I'm thinking is that when somebody now hires you to write their book to be a ghostwriter, they they could possibly see you more as a collaborator mm-hmm. than a hired hand, for lack of a better exactly. word, word, you know, exactly. and that you're really on a more equal footing with them as a thought leader because it's generally yes. kind of people thought leaders who have these processes that puts you on a different tier. Yeah, that's, and that's a real, that's really insightful. Okay. Because that's exactly what I'm going for with ghostwriting stuff. It's not that I am not willing to write books where I don't get credit. Mm -hmm. And it's not even really about quote unquote, getting credit. That's not really the thing. I just love being an equal collaborator in the process. Mm -hmm. And the reason I like my name to be on books when it feels right, when it makes sense for that to happen is because then I can be a much bigger help when it comes to the marketing of it. You know, like with the Elvis book, I was super involved in the marketing. They've involved me in all the marketing meetings with the PR people, with the marketing people, which was really, really fun to get to see the behind the scenes of all that. And uh, I mean, I don't know how much personally that I've, uh, I'm certainly not going to take credit for anything, but I think with my sort of little corner of the universe, I was able to get the word out about Elvis, Mm -hmm. about the Elvis book and hopefully make some sales and, and do some marketing for that. So yeah, I think it's fun because I can help. And what an opportunity for you too to see that, you know, what goes on in those, you know, the mysterious halls of the publisher when they're having those meetings. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really not one side. This was my first book for a big publisher and then now that I've been through it, I'm like, well, that really wasn't so mysterious. It was really very straightforward. There, you go. <laughs> there wasn't really anything mysterious about it. It was just, <laughs> it's just good people who are really good at what they do. And it's really fun to be part of a team though. That's what I really loved about this is you really are part of truly a team that's working on this singular creative activity. And it, it's kind of fun to do that because for those of us who run our own business or we work from home, sometimes you get kind of lonely. Mm-hmm. So being a part of a team for a specific project was really fulfilling to me. Yeah, that's good. That's a good point. It's I love being part of a team and then I'd like to scurry back to my cave and write and then I yeah. you know, but it, but it I is nice like to that. have the team to go to because you can they kind of feed off each other. It's like you yeah. need both. It's a it's a both and type of thing, not an either or. It's almost like I want I want relationships and teamwork, but I want it on my own terms. Yes. You know, it's like the true <laughs> introverts, the introverts <laughs> dilemma. I love people, but I only want to love people when I feel like loving people. Right. I love people, really but I have a time limit. limit. That's kind of my my thing. Yeah. There's a time the clock, limit. The clock is ticking. Yep. Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't want to make people feel like, oh, you're on the clock. But, it's, but you're kind of on the clock. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's just, okay. I used to feel guilty about that, but I just now I've just learned to embrace it. Mm-hmm. 
And, you know, if I, like yesterday I had, I think four Zoom calls. Ooh. There have been days where I've had as many as six, like hour long Zoom calls, which was oh. a mistake, which was a scheduling mistake on my part. Yeah, that's hard. On those days, I'm just trashed afterwards. Maybe trash is the right word. I'm tired, not trashed. <laughs> I haven't like been doing drugs. But you know what I mean? You just feel depleted. And yeah. I think if we can learn to embrace the limits of our energy, that's better. Yeah, understand how we work. Totally. Yeah, that's, a, totally. that's a good thing to do. Yeah. I talked about that a couple of episodes ago, and I actually used your daily writer retreat mm -hmm. for an Which, example. That was a great episode. I loved it. I loved oh, it. Awesome. I Thank learned you. stuff about my own retreat. Oh, cool. <laughs> which was awesome. Well, it was funny because I was going to share some things I learned at the retreat, but actually one of the biggest things I learned was this whole interacting with people on this different scale. And yeah. I'm not a big real, you know, in-person real event person if it's big but the way you structured it really worked for me and i did not feel depleted at the end of your event which was that's huge like that doesn't happen so i was really surprised by that because i assumed that again we're talking about assumptions sometimes we assume wrongly we were talking about that i think before we hit record yeah i assumed that people were going to be kind of taxed out around three o'clock in the afternoon that we would have a couple hours before dinner and that would be that. I was not prepared for how chatty everybody was. I, I mean, these were mostly introverts. I yes. was really surprised by that. But I think it was also the idea where you're in kind of this house. It's not a, it's a small group. Everybody's very relaxed. It's very chill. There's no, we got to start at like 6 a.m. with an intensive planning session, you know, kind of a deal. So maybe, maybe the vibe of that has something to do with it. I don't know. Yeah, it was great. I mean, there were little places like you could go find a a, a room or you could find a corner somewhere if you needed a, a moment totally. just to, of, of quiet. It was great. And I think just also we had relationship already because we've been on Zoom yes. calls with, with each other for what, a year or two or three or, or yeah. more, <laughs> however long you've been running the Daily Writer Club. So, yeah, which makes a difference. Yeah, it does. Relationship is so important. You know, we talk about that with the Mission Writers Program. We talk about it with, you know, in, in business, in anything that we do, we've got to have these relationships and we don't go go after them grudgingly like, oh, I have to have these relationships. Right. They're they're truly right. life-giving and uh, like know your own limits of of how you're going to manage those things. I don't think so. Yeah, that's a good yeah. point. It's that's good. a really good point. So we talked about structure. We talked about how you got to be a ghostwriter. But tell us about, you've got, besides the Elvis book, I know you've got the other books that you've ghostwritten that you can't really talk about, but you've also got books of your own. I do. So, so tell us about those. You've got, I know you've got 18, was it 18 words to live by? Yes. So a book that came out last April is mm -hmm. called 18 Words to Live By. The subtitle is A Father's Wisdom on What Matters Most. And I wrote that book as a gift to my son for his 18th birthday. I love that. So last summer, this would have been the summer of 2021. You know how this is, Kay, as a parent, sometimes you just kind of have this realization of, oh, my kid's going to be 18. Or mm -hmm. or if your kid's younger, oh, my kid's going to be in junior high or they're going to be a teenager or whatever. And I had this sudden realization of, wow, oh. I need to really think about a cool gift for his 18th birthday. It's kind of a milestone birthday. Mm -hmm. And because writing is kind of my main thing, I thought, well, I want to write a book for him. But it wasn't just because I wanted to just do it as a gift. I also wanted something that he could carry with him through his life and that he would appreciate when he was 40. That's mm -hmm. really, that's what I kept in mind as I wrote this book is he's 18. He's not going to really appreciate this a lot now. Now, he has been very appreciative. I think he he's read most of it. I don't think he's read the whole thing probably, which is okay. <laughs> but I thought, okay, when he's midlife, he'll appreciate this a lot more. Yeah. So I kind of crafted it with, with that in mind. And that was a really fun book. It's just a little short book, kind of filled with life lessons. And then my previous book before that was one called The Artist's Suitcase. It's just a little short book on the creative journey mm -hmm. where I took each letter of the alphabet, and I have a little short chapter on something related to that. For example, A is for attitude. D is for doubt. How do you deal with doubt? L is for love. 
Do you really love the people you're serving with your art and your writing? That kind of thing. Then next summer, I've got a book coming out called The Daily Writer, which is kind of the big one I've been working on for a while. Mm -hmm. And that is a book of daily meditations for a whole year for writers. So it's very much structured like Ryan Holiday's The Daily Stoic book or Todd Henry's Daily Creative book, where it's just like a, it's kind of like devo daily devotionals for writers. It doesn't really have a spiritual emphasis, but that's kind of what it is. So that's coming out next year. And I've got a few other smaller books coming out as well. So yeah, keeping busy with the writing stuff for sure. That's great. And I, I want to point out, you know, as you're listening, that, that Kent is talking about structure a lot. You know, you had the structure, the storytelling structure that you used with with Billy Stanley, where mm -hmm. he's telling stories and they were each chapter was kind of around a, a little a, a theme or part, you know, you titled, I think you used a, a song title for each chapter. Yes. And, and, and I can I can tell you more about the the story arc of, of that yeah. book if you if you want to hear that. Sure. Cause structure so, is a is such a we talked about that being the container and the thing that helps us right really put the stuff together. So it's the key. So I never actually told the publisher this, nor did I tell Billy this, but I had to have my own. And I don't say this, like when I talk about the book, I don't say this a lot, but you'll understand what I mean by this because you mm -hmm. understand story structure is I had to have an overarching story. You had to, you've got to have a hero's journey in the book. So in the book, what I got from Billy was all these stories of his life with Elvis from the time he was a kid to the time when he was lost Elvis. And then and then Billy had a spiritual experience where he talked with Elvis in the afterlife. And then we kind of have a, con a concluding chapter that sort of wraps everything up. So, so I had to have a way as an author to make sense of all this collection of stories mm -hmm. while having a story arc to the, the whole thing. Cause it can't just be like, here's a chapter on this, here's a chapter on this, here's a chapter on this. Right. So I was working on the book one day and early in the process. And I was like, I just can't quite get my head around what the, what the character arc is for this book. And then it all of a sudden occurred to me that Billy is the hero in the story because he really is the one who is undergoing change. He's the one who's learning from Elvis. He's being mentored by Elvis. And Elvis really functions as the mentor in the story. In some ways, Elvis functions as a Christ figure, meaning he's dispensing wisdom and advice and knowledge in some kind of a supernatural sense. Then he dies at, at the end of the story. Bill, then Billy has an experience in the afterlife with him. And so in many ways, that that's kind of how I thought of it. Now, I never said that in the book because a lot of people wouldn't understand what I mean by right. Elvis is a Christ figure. And But it was funny, somebody in my family, when the book came out, before it came out, they had an advanced copy. And they said, you kind of talk like Elvis, almost like he's Jesus in the book. And I was like, that's interesting because I never said that in the book, but yet she still picked up on that which is exactly what I intended. Now, all those stories are true. They are accurate according to Billy. But the way that I present them was I had to have a journey that Billy goes on and also a journey that Elvis goes on himself in the story. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the overarching way that I thought about the whole structure of the book. I never told that to really anybody else, but that that was my own thinking behind it. I, think, I don't even know, you know if all that makes sense or not, but that's that was... It, my it view. does because, and I remember when, when I wrote my review of it and I was going like, cause I was only partway through when I wrote the review mm -hmm. and all the parts I had read was, you know, when Billy first came into the, into Graceland, you know, he was what, eight or nine years old, somewhere around in there. Yeah, I think six. six Some, or okay. Six. So, so he's a little like kid and now all of a sudden mm -hmm. he has this big brother. Well, what, what do right. little kids idolize their big brothers? I mean, totally. And, and that's, and then Elvis was so cool. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, and he really was in real life. I wasn't yeah. just, I, I was very careful in the book to not embellish anything, to mm -hmm. not exaggerate anything. Mm -hmm. Like it is all exactly as it was told to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that comes across. I mean, I saw that whole first part of the book, you see a child looking up to his big brother. Yes. Literally. And, and yeah. And you see this kind of not starstruck, you know, Elvis kind of stuff. They didn't even know who Elvis was, when it came to right. Elvis, which I thought was really cool. And, and probably Elvis, you get the feeling Elvis thought that was cool too. And um, absolutely. And so, you know, but, but you do get this kind of 
you get that relationship. I think you did a really good job with that. I love what you said that the hero is the one who changes. Billy's the, mm-hmm. Billy changes throughout it. Yeah. You know, of course he grows yeah. up. We're, it's really Billy grows up and it's this influence exactly. that Elvis had on him. And, and so our insight into to Elvis is, is all through Billy's eyes. Yes. And so I just, I just love the way you told the the story that way. And, and you, we saw Elvis age in yeah. the book as well. Yeah. Like you could see, you could, you could f- begin to feel the weight of the fame and the, the ways management was, were, was happening and the, right. all of the things right. that happen around celebrity and the, the different pressures and the things that, that, that you have to deal with when you're kind of at that level of super, super stardom and trying to be normal. So, yeah. And the thing that people that I never realized before working on this project was that there was no model for what Elvis was doing. I mean, yeah. you know, like the, the, one of the biggest celebrities that he might've had to model his career. And in some sense was Frank Sinatra, who was, whose career was very different than Elvis's. But if you think of kind of the model of the superstar today, hmm. people who are in movies, they do music, they're on TV, they do concerts and all this stuff. There wasn't really that kind of a person that Elvis could look to as somebody to model his career after. So mm-hmm. he was really the first major, major celebrity of that stature who was involved in all these different things. So he was making this all up. I mean, he created the model of the modern rock star or, or mm-hmm. really of the modern celebrity. So I tend to look at his story and, and a lot of people are, you know, they're like, well, Elvis, you know, he was into drugs and there was the women and there was all the stuff. And I'm like, yeah, but, and now that's true. But I also tend to look at Elvis with a lot of sympathy and a lot of hurt in my own heart because of all the pressure he was dealing with. Mm-hmm. And I'm just surprised it wasn't more of a wreck, you know, earlier. I mean, for him to have gone that long with that much pressure and all these different dynamics, I mean, is really commendable and really pretty remarkable in in my view. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think if I, if I were wearing Elvis' shoes, I would have, I would crash and burn (laughs) way earlier than, you know, I would experience a lot of problems probably way earlier than what he did. Mm-hmm. When you did through the book, you saw him going back to the Bible and going yeah. and trying to find that equilibrium, you know, somewhere, find trying to totally. find his footing. In, and that's where he went to find it, which was great. Yeah. Yeah. And people have point. never really heard that before. Yeah. Yeah. So great job on that. So you structured you. that kind of like hero's journey type of type yeah. of story. And then you had a different structure for your and i'm i'm hounding on the structure here because as i teach people to to write these nonprofit stories i'm always talking about if you have a structure it's easier <laughs> so way easier yeah then for your 18 words you had a different structure for mm-hmm. that so like that was basically just a short chapter around each word and yes. each one can stand alone so like you said yep. you know your son he, he, you know, whether he picks it up and reads it all the way through, you know, as soon as you give it to him or whether he picks it a word here or there, whatever strikes him in whatever year he picks that up, it works. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I designed that book very, very intentionally. And it was actually an, kind of an experiment. I wanted to see if I could do everything in my power to create a book that was really readable, that was very simple and easy to understand and that people could read fast. Mm-hmm. And the way that I designed the the chapter, so you start off with the story, not always in the, every chapter, but most of the time there's a story or something to hopefully grab your attention. Then I have maybe a one or two or three points about whatever the topic is, and then conclude with some kind of, uh, I just call it buttoning up the chapter. Some kind of, something that's punchy or interesting or makes you think or something unexpected, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. So I designed every chapter like that, but I also physically in the book, and I was really, really adamant about this. I wanted to have a five by seven book because that is 
a very portable type of a paperback. Yeah, I wanted a book really people well could hand. grab and go. Exactly. Yeah. I wanted a book that you would feel compelled to pick up and take with you because it's so small. Mm-hmm. And just because the chapters are short, the and I actually worked really hard making every sentence and every paragraph as short as I possibly could get it. So I spent a lot of time eliminating unnecessary words and making the sentences short and punchy mm-hmm. just to make it readable, as readable as I possibly could. And then the number, the number one comment I've gotten from people on that book is that they read through it really fast, like in yeah. a day or two, which, and that, that for me kind of solidifies the idea of there's a lot of value in having a short little book with short chapters that people can get through really fast. Mm-hmm. I think there's there's a big market for the short books because, and we talked about this on the Daily Writer retreat. You know, people are just inundated with information. We don't need information, yeah, just straight up information. But we do need, you know, a book that can carry us somewhere, take us somewhere else, can give us escape. Exactly. I've read in the past couple of years, I've read more fiction than I have read in the whole rest of my life. Wow, and. And normally I'm a nonfiction person completely, but uh, I just, I'm like, I'm done with nonfiction right now. <laughs> I'll write it, but I won't read it right now. <laughs> I'll come, I'm, I'm coming back to it, you know, but, but I just, I was like, I just need some fiction in my life. <laughs> and <laughs> I love that. <laughs> but, you know, we, but when we structure this, whether it's a book or a story that we tell in a newsletter or, or, or that we share, you know, over email, however we're communicating with people, you've got to give them something of value. You've got to give it to them fast and you've got to give them, give it to them exactly. in a format and a structure that's going to serve them. Uh, and I think if we remember that, we will do ourselves a favor <laughs> as well as our readers a favor. Yeah. And it just, it makes it easier when you're writing a book in particular to have a, a model that you follow. Mm-hmm. So I did a podcast interview with uh, an author named Janet McHenry last week, and she does a lot of author coaching. She's written a couple dozen books, and she used the phrase a mentor book, which I'd never heard before. Mm. I do the same thing, but I'd never heard that phrase before, and I'm totally going to start using it. It's the idea that whenever you write a book, always have a book that you're modeling yours after. You're not stealing content or plagiarizing. It's none of that, but you're following the same structure and vibe or the feel of the Mm. book, and that's what I do with every book. Every time I do a client book, I always ask, what are two or three books that you kind of want yours to feel like? You know, the, the books that you like and the way that, th- that those make you feel when you read them, mm-hmm. how can we make your book give the, your reader the same vibe or the same feeling? Yes. I find that to be really, really helpful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and there's no one template like when you say, okay, here's how you write a book. It's there's really no, you know, it's who are you writing it for and who are you exactly? What do you want to make them what do you want them to do? How do you want them to feel? All all of those things come into it and they play into what exactly. structure you need. Yep, I totally agree. Well, just really, really good. What this is my my last question for the podcast it will be. What's one thing we can do today to improve our storytelling? Well, I'm going to give an unconventional answer, right. and that is watch more TV and movies. <laughs> but I want to quanti- I want to qualify that by saying do it with intention and do it with the idea of analyzing stories and TV shows or movies where really there's so much there, there's so there's so many blurry lines between those two today. You know, like if you like the TV show Yellowstone or whatever, that's 10 episodes a season. That's really like one long movie, one 10 hour movie. So, but I, I would probably pick a movie because they're, it's going to be shorter to analyze than a 10 hour mini series or something, True. <laughs> but pick something that speaks to you mm-hmm. and break it down and reverse engineer it. So you can really understand how stories are told. And I've done this many, many times. And I find it to be a really, really helpful exercise for, for example, Take a movie and literally you watch the movie and you make a list of here's all the scenes. Mm -hmm. What are they trying to do in this scene? Why is this scene in the movie? What would be missing if this scene were not here? Because if a movie is written and if if Hollywood has invested millions of dollars into a a movie, that means they're pretty confident. It's solid. It's got a good script and all that stuff. Mm 
-hmm. So, I mean, these are people who are really, really good at what they do. They are professionals and experts. So in pretty much every scene, there's going to be a dialogue or there's going to be action that advances the story forward. But if you can reverse engineer that and look at how it's put together, then you're going to learn a lot about storytelling, I think. And you can read lots of craft books about storytelling, most of which are written by people who just write craft books on storytelling. <laughs> you know, there's it's like a weird thing in the yeah. the writer industry. Like people who make a whole career out of telling you how to how to tell stories, but they don't they've never actually like had a movie produced or right. you know. Yeah. It's 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 this really weird kind of a deal with the writing industry. But anyway, I think movies are great because we all know movies, we love movies. So if you can figure out how things are structured, then that really goes a long way toward helping you, I think, tell better stories. Yeah, that's good. I had one of the fiction books that I read this summer. I just, I read it for an escape. I wasn't trying to study it or anything. And then the ending, he pulled together so many different storylines, even storylines that I hadn't recognized really. Interesting. At the end, and there were connections that I didn't catch. And I ended up, I finished the last chapter. It was an audio book. So I went back and re-listened to like the last hour huh. of the book to try and in my head put together the stories. And there's still one character that I can't quite place. And I know that it's, you know, maybe I missed something. You know, sometimes I'll listen to a book as I'm falling asleep and I'm like, I must have missed Hmm. A, a section there that I did I missed a connection and it was just fascinating to me how the author could keep all those stories straight <laughs> and bring them together yeah. at, at the end and I was just like okay bravo <laughs> you know something else I do and I'll throw this in there is I like to go back and read the books I loved as a kid mm -hmm. for inspiration so right now I'm rereading Charlotte's Web by E.B. White mm -hmm. I mean it's a classic book but the reason they're classic and they continue to be classics is because there's they speak to people on a very mm -hmm. simple level. They're not necessarily simple stories, but they use simple language and direct storytelling to really keep you hooked. And they're short chapters, simple yet engaging characters with an emotional story. And I think there's something really fundamentally important about that. So pay attention to the things that you really love. What makes you laugh? What makes you cry? What engages your emotions? There's a reason that thing appeals to you. And if you can sit down and really figure out how did the how did the creator make this thing, whether it's a movie or a book or whatever it is, what are the things about it that that engage that engage my emotions? Mm -hmm. And if you can identify those things, then you can turn around and use those same things in your own storytelling. Well, Kent, thank you so much for being here on, totally the, my on pleasure. The, the podcast. This has been great. I mean, I, we could talk all day on, cause I love, I love learning from you, which I get to do in your, your daily writer club, but just, you know, the structure and the way books are put together is it's everything. If you want to write something, whether it's short or long, if you can figure out the structure, yeah. you're, you're halfway done. Yeah, I think so. And it it's not rocket science, really. Right. It's just, if there's a book that, that you like and you want yours to sort of read like, just figure out how they put together the chapter and the chapters in the book, in the books that you enjoy and just kind of break it down and pay attention to it. It's, I mean, it's right there on the page. There's no secrets. That's true. So it's just a matter of, I think, paying attention and looking at the details and then stealing their ideas. <laughs> of yes, course. Absolutely. <laughs> That's what we do. <laughs> well, thank you. This has been an absolute pleasure. I've really enjoyed this. Yeah. Thanks, Ken.